So, my dear friends, welcome to this unique webinar on post-COVID complications and the importance of thoracic surgery in managing these complications. Today, I invite Dr. Nasir Yusuf, who doesn't need any introduction in India, and he's very, very well known across pulmonologists particularly, because he's known for his uh, generous training programs, observerships for pulmonologists across India from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. So, Sir has obtained his MBBS and Masters in Surgery from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Aligarh. He specialized in cardiac thoracic surgery at KMC Manipal and secured the gold medal. Dr. Yusuf further trained in UK. He telescoped those skills to Fatima Hospital. Calicut, where in 1998, the first bypass surgery was performed in Malabar. With the mushrooming of many cardiac centers and the cry, of, cry and cough of lungs were drowned and the thoracic surgery took a back seat in India. His response was to Pioneer keyhole surgery of chest. His hallmark surgeries include operating on a critically ill five day old baby with the pus in the heart and on a one out five year old man with a burst lung and removal of 2.5 kg tumor from the chest, reported as one of the largest tumors ever. Dr. Yusuf was invited to perform the first live workshop in India on thoracoscopy at the National Conference in 2010. He was the organizing chairman for the national workshops in chest for two consecutive years, 2019 and 2020, a record in itself. To his name, he has got many publications in scientific journal. To his name, he continues to give lectures on at various platforms. He was the past president, president of Calicut Cardiology Club. Dr. Yusuf's interest stretches beyond the professional realm of to Primosonry, Roundtable, MES, MSS, Cisco. His strong sense of service is highlighted by the contribution in the treatment and rehabilitation of victims of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in the early 1990s. He is an associate professor and adjunct faculty in Manipal University. Presently, he works in Calicut in chest and PBS hospitals in Kochi at Sunrise Hospital and Kim's Group. His achievements and contributions were recognized in 2004 when he was awarded the prestigious Vijay Shri Award in 2018, and he was honored by Indian Institute of Management for his contribution to medical tourism. And with this short intro, I would love to invite my dear friend, and he's like my teacher figure, Dr. Nazar, to take over from now. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Harshwardhan Puri, for those glamorous and lovely words. I hope I can live up to your expectations as well as to the CCI. My talk shall be on post-COVID lung sequelae role of surgery. It's just a matter to open up discussions. So I shall not be going into great detail. Uh, also, I should thank the backbone, the spine, the very 
person, the only one and very person, Dr. Krishna, who has done a wonderful job all these years to bring together young talent of the country. COVID is similar to tsunami. Tsunami strikes for a couple of hours and passes off leaving a trail of destruction, loss of property, lives and livelihood. Similarly, COVID, which leaves the body within two weeks, but at times has a devastating impact primarily on the lung, brain, and the heart. The number of cases and the death is quite imposing. However, some of these patients may benefit from surgery, but no guidelines exist for patients who require surgery for post-COVID lung complications currently because there's a lack of evidence or precedent. We at our center are happy to say is a part of a multi-center trial based in Italy. Few surgeons and centers venture into this uncharted, unknown territory. However, what we have found in our limited experience is that certain group of patients do benefit from surgery. The course which is of concern to us is that the patients may have crippling fatigue, continued breathlessness, cough, hemoptysis, chest pain, rectal infections for weeks and months, even after COVID has left that body. These issues are not limited to patients who suffer from severe COVID, but also are seen in even those with mild form of infection. The more serious complications include lung fibrosis, leading to breathlessness and clots in blood vessels. Numerous tests and various modalities of treatment are required. Most survive, however, in a certain percentage. Mounting expenses on a daily basis lead to an economically drained, frustrated, dejected, and depressed patient. However, every cloud has a silver line. This young boy flew in from Jalor, Rajasthan with a ruptured lung with a BPF which is following code. He had a hazardous journey, but eventually made it. And this was the early days, sometime in April, 2020, one of the first cases in the country, which we adventurously, boldly went in and operated. Having little experience as to how to manage the case, how to deal with COVID, but using the available knowledge, we went ahead. Rationale in COVID. Lung fibrosis, as we all know, is one of the main reasons for shortness of breath. And if the disease is generalized, the treatment then, as we know and practice, is medical management. When medical management fails, in certain patients, lung transplant. However, if the disease is localized, such patients we could possibly consider for early surgery and almost complete recovery. And these are areas like localized pneumonia, cavity, aspergilloma, local mycosis of lung, empyema, bronchopleural fistula, localized bronchi bronchi cases, infected pneumatocele, bulla, prom pulmonary thromboembolism, pulmonary infarction. That area of VTE and pulmonary infarction, we have very little experience. Now coming to the specific conditions, when the infection is confined to a local area, say in this particular case, in the lower low region, one could consider, the right lower low, one could consider resection and patients have persistent uh, symptoms like cough, fever, chest pain, breathlessness. Sometimes a cavity develops in this infected area and which may enlarge, causing further breathlessness. However, the progression of the disease is stable in the lung. This cavity can cause bleeding and recurrent infection. And this will harbor a fungal infection, 
causing aspergilloma and massive bleeding. Again, local resection towards the problem. In certain cases, or it could cause in COVID black fungus, which we are all familiar with, a rare disease, but mostly affects the paranasal sinuses, orbits, brain, and sometimes the lung. Mostly it can be treated medically, but at times surgery is required, and this is what happens in the lung. As you can see, with time, bilateral infiltrates, then can come down to a localized area, the rest of the lung clearing up, however, a patient continues to have symptoms and required surgery for his alleviation. Another area which is pretty common is this condition called empyema. Usually starts with an empyema, then at times, as I shall show you shortly, the lung surface is so fragile that it bursts, ruptures, multiple abscesses occur, and a BPF is formed. So you have an air fluid level, complete collapse of the right lung, patient not improving with medical management and conservative measures like chest tube. Why so? As you can write, see here, is as we go in, those are on the right side, so three lobes, but it's all pus. It's all the entire, almost the entire lung. Look as the in the right lower lobe, you can see infected areas all through. So this particular patient had not only fibrosis below the pleura and a small collection of lymphocytes and intravascular hemorrhagic thrombosis on uh, pathology. The patient had multiple areas of bleed. As this witness clearly here, this is the hole. This is the perforated area of the lung. This is the underlying lung abscess, which is ruptured. And therein is, you can see, we instill fluid into the pleural cavity, ask our friends across as the anesthetist to back, and we clearly see where the long pleural fistula. The challenge here is, this can normally be closed with stitches. However, please remember, there are three conditions which are extremely difficult to operate and treat. They are tuberculosis, malignancy, post-radiation, as well as now COVID. Of the three, COVID lung is so stiff that stitches tend to cut through. This is an endothelized, epithelialized bronchopleural fistula. So surgery does help patients recover from post-COVID complications as was evidence. And this was one of the first cases of empyema we did. Now the infection, when it clears up, leave a destruction behind. The infected portion of lung is permanently destroyed by bronchiectasis, multiple number of small cavities, which appear like honeycomb. This can only be treated by surgery. Otherwise, with time, this keeps slowly invading the neighboring structures and the lesion becomes brittle. Matosia. This is fairly commonly seen in patients with COVID. Most of them get resolved and medically and do not really require any further intervention. This is due to a diffuse alveolar damage followed by necrosis of the airway walls with it that can cause this pneumatosia presence of crown glass opacities, air-filled thin wall cystic lesions. This is so because it's predominantly a peripheral lesion and subpleural in distribution. Rupture of the pneumothorax in turn may be the trigger for occurring of pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, and pneumopericardium. The size of COVID-19 related pneumatoceles is also highly variable with some falling in the category of giant bullet. Pneumatoceal inside will be clear. In bullet, you could have striation separation within the bulla. And this is a pretty large bulla post-COVID. And we are now going in into the plural cavity just to demonstrate 
see the surface of this bullet, it shows multiple blood vessels. They pretty thick wall as compared to any matricium. In this particular case, um, the patient was quite dysnic and breathless. We decided to remove the bullet. There were multiple bullet. Uh, release the additions, and thereafter, fire a stapler at the base. Sometimes we need multiple staplers. And whatever the rest of the bullet, which would be small bullet on the surface, can be cauterized. This is staple surface. This is bullet being cauterized in the rest of the lung. Yes, now primary thromboembolism embolism, we do know occurs, but we have had no experience in an emergent situation. But as you can see in this particular patient, this bilateral thromboembolism, multiple opacities, and there is all, you know, you can see the diseased areas. And when we do an iron map, a triangular area was found, which is almost dead, peripheral primary infarct. If this and this patients, if they have symptoms, can easily be attended to by resizing this area. Now, briefly, we just run through what patients we can help is there are more questions than answers because the current evidence is very little, data, there is a paucity, and there is no precedent. The challenges we face are why surgery that you've realized because it is, uh, can be done in certain cases, as we discussed, where it is local. Who is a candidate? That is a big, big question. The patient should have minimal comorbidities, but usually they have diabetic and associated lung problems, but kind of optimize them to a reasonable effort to about 80% of FEV1 predicted and uh, exertional dyspnea to a minimum. Saturations around 94. And where to do? Of course, identify the lesion localized, the zibula or the lung part, which is set, uh, affected, we can resect that area. When to operate is a big question. Obviously, it should be after the patient becomes COVID negative. But what we have found that over, as long as we can push it, the longer we can push the surgery, it gives time for the lung to recover. And what is the outcome? It's very good. Very encouraging results we have. And what the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the American Patient Safety Foundation issued a joint statement for when to take up these surgeries. But this is for elective patients and not for lung surgeries, but we can extrapolate and logically look at it. Pulmonary function continues to recover up to three months. Suggested wait times would be anywhere between eight to 16 weeks, especially if the patient is diabetic or immunocompromised and maximum, maximum leverage we get and time for prehabilitation for the lung. And this is what we aim for. Saturations around 98, 91 to 98 will be fine. Usually this is seen in six to 16 weeks. Ideally about 12 to 16 weeks, we get patients getting up these saturations but have symptoms. And this is, but when they exert, the saturations will drop in these patients. FVC around 3.72. Percentage of vital capacity, 106 is what we would like to aim for, but after a while it stagnates, then there's no point waiting. FEV1 around 2.55, and similarly the percentage. D dimer should always be preferably less than 0.5. Finally, we found an incidental benefit in patients with COVID when they've been screened or CT scans throw up surprises like detection of early TB and its complications, cancerous and non-cancerous both have been diagnosed, which could otherwise have become serious in the future. This we share our experience and that was published. Ours is a limited experience. Uh, we have had one mortality and major complications one. The numbers are not huge, but you know, working in the private sector, we have our limitations. 
quality of life improves, quality of life improves, patients can ambulate with minimal or no requirement of oxygen, thus converting them from respiratory cripples to productive humans. Patients are relieved of their symptoms like cough, breathlessness, hemoptysis, fever, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. Surgery may be done through minimally invasive techniques through multiple small incisions. Now, the points to ponder we have discussed is that uh, surgery is definitely an option, but again, that selected group of patients with post-COVID lung ailment, like localized pneumonia, cavity, aspergilloma, mucormycosis, empyema, BPF, localized bronchitis, infected pneumoth pneumatocele. Uh, these are areas, and of course, in pulmonary infarct may be considered. However, believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who has said it, not even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. A little bit of philosophy, take home thoughts, years of experience. Uh, buildings and machines, my dear friends, do not treat patients. God, through your hands of doctors, treat patients. Please think about of the box, challenge guidelines logically, be the difference and be the change. And finally, please remember to cure sometimes, to relieve often, to comfort always. I have the onus of carrying things forward from here. And we can we are all saved of the embarrassment or myself the blushes of uh, appreciation and accolades for just concluded talk. They say never apologize when you start a talk. However, I have to for obvious reasons, and thank Dr. Vijay Kumar for the introduction in place of Dr. Harshwardhan Puri, who was tied up because of logistics and network problem. Uh, sorry, Harsh. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar. So I'm back. Right. You're welcome, sir. Right. May I now invite Dr. Vijay Kumar, who is the brain behind the CCI webinars, lead pulmonologist in Apollo, interventional pulmonologist too. Uh, now we've just heard what the surgeon's perspective is. I would just like briefly, if uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar could say uh, what a pulmonologist would think. Eventually it's the pulmonologist who refers the patient. We come in much later. What are your feelings or opinion on this? And I have another question after that for you. Don't go away. So can you please pardon me? Okay, your question, please. One more time. You just heard yeah. what a surgeon felt about the role of surgery in COVID. Yes, sir. Largely, largely, it's all medical management. And only yeah. lately, we have come into the picture. Yes, sir. Um, from your perspective as a pulmonologist, what do you think? So ultimately, as you rightly said in the in your conclusion uh, slide, you have to challenge the guidelines, and uh, you have to make sure that exactly to read, think out of the box, challenge guidelines, be the difference, be the change that you want to see in your patients. So unless we, because we all know about COVID only for the past one and a half to two years. What may appear to be correct for one patient may not be correct for the other patient. So always we should keep our eyes open and make sure that in the given circumstances, we have to deliver the best, nothing but the best in the interest of the patient. Unless we do like that, we, we're going to miss the boat. 
So there will be a narrow um, window where we can intervene and then save these patients. You have set the tone for today's webinar absolutely phenomenal and uh, you, your talk was great. So I would like to quote an example here. Example, if we have a patient who is on ECMO, we are about to, we are trying to wean from the, uh, from the ECMO. There are no golden rules when exactly we can wean this patient. But on a whole, we must see whether the patient is overall fit enough for weaning trial. If he is fit enough for the weaning trial, we must take a bold decision and then make sure that the same decision has been transferred to the family members who are sitting outside the ICUs for days together. And then we have to take, a, take the decision and then take the responsibility onto, onto our shoulder and then do it. That's how we can win the hearts of the patients and then families. So absolutely brilliant talk, sir. Looking forward for a great evening along with all other panelists. Thank you, sir. Uh, don't go away, Vijay. Yeah. Uh, a fragile lung due to COVID. Yep. Right, it's a case scenario. Are you yeah, up to it? Uh, it could be due to uh, uh, tuberculosis. It could be due to infections or you know pseudomonas or klebsiella. We see a lot of that. Or it could be fungal aspergillosis. What is your experience? You know, you do bowel. I'm sure probably at times do you consider bowel and do you see any complications like a pneumothorax developing? No. So this is one uh, very rare complications I did come across in one of my young patient. So to be honest, out of thousands of bronchoscopies which we have done, so unless we attempt a lung biopsy, it is very difficult to predict a pneumothorax to come as a complication. But we have had one case where the patient landed in pneumothorax just after bronchoscopy and uh, collecting bron bronchial washings from two, three cavities which were there in that patient. So very unusual complication. But uh, my point is, however the stable patient looks like, However, the patient is, uh, CAT scans looks like reasonably stable. You should be well prepared to handle such a complication because this patient whom I am referring, okay, was a chronic sarcoid patient, young female. So this patient, as soon as she developed the pneumothorax, she dropped the saturations and my team was uh, thinking of what was what went wrong. Uh, it, it was a subtle uh, pneumothorax. So we went in and then did an x-ray. Auscultation was very clean. Bilateral air entry was clear. So we did an x-ray and then identified a pneumo. And meanwhile, within 20-30 minutes, she dropped to uh, her saturation to as low as 60. We have to intervene and then uh, we could uh, save her from a uh, catastrophe. So, though rare, but we should be very cautious and then we should think of such complications post bronchoscopy, particularly in COVID lungs. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vijay. There's been a host of, host, the last number of questions that come up in the chat box. May I now introduce Dr. Deepti Hassan, young, charming, very articulate lady from Hassan, works in the Institute of Medical Sciences there. Uh, maybe we'll have to jump out and take this question uh, from Dr. Samadhan Bahekar, Jalgao, Maharashtra. What are the post-COVID lung complications? I think that we most of them have discussed. And what changes we expect on chest x-ray, HRCT, PFT, six-minute walk test? Uh, that's a whole uh, session uh, there itself, uh, but uh, I'll try to cover uh, something there. Uh, let me begin by the chest imaging part. 
I think any patient, post-COVID patient, who is deteriorating. So we are having a, a post-COVID patient who is uh, not responding to your treatment. There is a resistant hypoxia. Or uh, there is a patient who was responding and suddenly started deteriorating. So these are the patients for whom you are going to consider a repeat uh, CT scan or a repeat X-ray because you are suspecting that something extra is happening there. So that is when you start looking for these so-called post-COVID complications. And one among uh, the first among those would be a pneumothorax because that is when you are having a sudden deterioration. So a pneumothorax, of course, I need not uh, elaborate on how uh, it is going to look on an X-ray or a CT. But uh, somewhere down the lane, uh, a BPF is a, a complication of uh, one of the, uh, as uh, Dr. Vijay just mentioned, a fragile lung. So uh, a BPF can happen uh, after uh, any uh, bronchoscopy uh, procedure that was done, or if there was a um, any other simple procedure done for uh, as simple as a turuta. So yeah, if if yeah, if anything like that has happened, or even if uh, the patient had a history of a mechanical ventilation, even a barrow trauma can cause pneumothorax. So there are so many reasons why a patient should develop pneumothorax. And uh, even while uh, intubating, if that that could be some tracheal tear, anything can happen. So uh, pneumothorax is one indication to be uh, to look out for. The second one would be, of course, mucormycosis. So uh, any cavity uh, with uh, uh, air fluid level, or if there is a ball, a fungal ball, or if there is a uh, halo sign that is, uh, well, uh, we are uh, looking for reverse halo signs. So these are the other uh, uh, things that we look out for on a CT scan to uh, uh, look out for these uh, complications. Apart from that, uh, other um, general complications are uh, any other uh, deterioration of the pleural uh, effusion, that is m or anything like that, which means... Chat, it's like one of the minimize here. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So that would be a rough uh, uh, how uh, we would look for chest imaging mm -hmm. and uh, a post-COVID complication. Well, thank you so much, Dr. VP. I was intending to put this question in the form of pre-operative uh, evaluation. And when would you run out of options and say, okay, this is it. We are now going to call in the surgeon. Where would you have the threshold of uh, maximum medical treatment? Any thoughts on those? Uh, sir, uh, as far as mucormycosis is concerned, I think uh, there is no waiting for a medical therapy. Uh, we start, we usually, uh, surgery is uh, one among the first uh, considerations uh, when it comes to mucormycosis because uh, the better uh, uh, salvage is done in by a surgeon itself, the uh, me medicine part actually comes, uh, 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 I mean, in a rare uh, case, actually, medicine comes later and surgery comes first. Uh, I should say, in a mucor case. But of course, uh, we start give a good course of antibiotics, antifungals. We are expecting okay. that a good uh, a clearance happens before the surgeon takes over. So it is not like uh, we jump into a surgery, but a good clearance has, uh, is uh, attempted before a surgeon a surgery can happen. But of course, the first step is to go ahead and you know remove the bulk of uh, tissue, which has already been invaded. Because usually uh, it is so rapid that the injury invasion would have happened. So uh, there is no uh, point in waiting uh, for long and uh, uh, letting this really go into the uh, brain or you know really worsen the situation. So uh, the best option is surgery for a uh, mycosis. But provided you have given a good uh, clearance, uh, a good antifungal before that. So yes, surgery uh, is, uh, for mucor case, of course, surgery is a um, good option. But for other cases, uh, like a BPF, I would say, if it is a small BPF, there is, uh, the, I mean, uh, I would really go ahead for a bronchoscope, uh, uh, you know, to cover that part. Because uh, a small BPF can be easily uh, closed with a, a bronchoscope itself. But a large BPF, more than uh, 8 uh, mm or something, then of course, Again, there there is no much uh, chance that uh, any other procedure would work. So again, uh, surgery would be the option. Thank you. 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 Thank
So some cases it's, it is point blank surgeries, but uh, there are uh, there is a gray area where uh, a bronchoscopy, a thoracoscopy can make a difference. And then again, there are uh, conditions where we do give our best efforts with medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Deepthi. We have a question from a stalwart from Mumbai. I'm surely a very active member in our group, a senior person. I have a lot of respect for it. Dr. Sridip Chatterjee. He says, what, us, what is the minimum FVC and FEV1 to consider surgery? Maybe I'll take that question because FEV1, we would possibly aim for around 2.55 to 2.64, preferably, or, and, uh, you know, that would be the, probably we are aiming high. And FEV1, FEV1 about 93%. You know, usually within 12 weeks to 16 weeks, it goes up FEV1 to 93%, FVC to 3.72, and FEV1 to 2.5 and above. So, may I add upon a small point here, sir? Yeah, sure. So, generally, uh, when we give clearance, okay, apart from FEV1, FVC, we do a lot of other, you know, endurance-related pa parameters. But having okay. said this, purely depending on... Uh, Example, if you are taking a case of pneumonectomy and patient is having a 1.5 liter of FE1, obviously, when the, uh, the one lung is gone, the residual lung function you are measuring as FE1 of 1.5 liter. So even if you take off that, the lung which is grossly damaged, then there is no, uh, effectively, post-operative predicted FE1 doesn't change much. So this is a complex scenario. But what as per textbook guidelines says, at yes. least a 1.2 liter of FE1 predicted post-operative bronchodilator um, uh, uh, after bronchodilator response, okay, you must have a FE1 of around 1.2 to 1.5 liter to give clearance. That's good enough, I think. Oh, because particularly post-COVID cases, sir. So because mm -hmm. of uh, a lot of active inflammation in the adjacent lung, and a lot of restrictive deformities, their FVCs and FE1 always will be very suboptimal, not even 50%. So if we take purely that criteria, majority of our post-COVID cases may not fit enough for surgical correction. I quite agree with that, uh, Dr. Vijay, especially because when they say for pneumonectomy, classically for the surgeons, we've been told it's, uh, you should have an FE1 about two liters. Yeah. Right. But that is in a scenario where in, in malignancies, because all this data, all these guidelines are told to us from the West. Yes. They do not see these cases of destroyed lung, grossly inflamed ones, you know, and this is a, there's a ventilation perfusion mismatch when there's a yeah. destroyed lung. So really, we cannot go by this criteria, but we have to remember in COVID patients, it's a little different ballgame. For two reasons. One, there will be underlying lung damage, how much ever we wait. So we have to be a little cautious on that, on the on that aspect. And second is in surgery, the problem is the cooperation of the patient and pain tolerance. If the patient's pain tolerance is low, we are going into big trouble of hypostatic pneumonias. So and already a compromised lung. So we have to you know, diligently, carefully, cautiously tread on these patients. The better the tidal volume, great. But we have operated on 1.8 to 2 liters, or in fact, even, uh, but again, that's not for a pneumonectomy. That's again in COVID patients, segmentectomies or lobectomies. We have never done a pneumonectomy in a post-COVID situation because already I feel strongly the other lung too is compromised. However, we be move on. And may I now invite Dr. Harshwardhan, uh, I don't know how his video is going to be, how's his uh, audio going to be. Uh, he's uh, I guess, are you okay, Harsh Harsh yeah, from, uh, sir, sir. He works with Nadanta in Delhi, uh, dynamic, budding, young, smiling, charming gentleman again. Harsh, uh, we just talked about FEV1s and uh, FECs. <laughs> what is your take? But more importantly, well, would you consider pneumonectomy? Would you consider lobectomy? on, uh, it's say, 
you know, infected, say, localized pneumonia, bronchic disease. I'm not talking of uh, space occupying lesions or like, you know, air, spa air space lesions like infected hematoceles or bulla. But otherwise, what is your take on this matter? So uh, the point is uh, that uh, these post-COVID patients are, are a totally new ball game. Uh, do two things. Uh, first thing, it's a team approach. The treating these patients is a team approach. You need a good interventionist. You need a good pulmonologist backup. You need uh, a very good thoracic surgeon, and then a whole new whole team of ICU and all the stuff. And the second thing which I uh, want to make here is that uh, these surgeries, all these FEV ones and everything, are based on malignancies. Nobody has operated upon these post COVID patients yet. There is a very little data what we have. Basically, we go over the post-protective uh, values. So uh, I just want to uh, share the data with the uh, uh, bench that we have operated around 67 patients of post-COVID uh, complications. And in them, around uh, 28 were mucomycosis. So these 28 mucomycosis, we did pneumonectomy in one patient and we lost that patient. So... Um, multiple issues with doing a pneumonectomy, I would rather uh, restrain the house from uh, going for a complete lung resection on one side because of the inflammatory changes and uh, everything in the opposite lung. So try to do minimal surgery in these patients. If, if you can uh, go out by doing a segmentectomy or a wedge, that is the best thing to do. Maximum go for a uh, lobectomy. Bilobectomy is the Bexam surgery, which we have saved. These 22 patients of mycosis, we were able to uh, save 26 and two died. One a uh, uh, lobectomy and one a pneumonectomy. So I'll restrain myself from doing a pneumonectomy in these patients. Thank you so much. Very wise words. Um, now, can I introduce Dr. Um, Manjunath, young man. He's eagerly waiting. And I hope uh, I have a question for you, Manju is that uh, maybe that's from Professor R.V. Kumar, Telangana, Hyderabad. You probably know him. We all know him. Uh, is COVID patients with pneumomedia stain, has surgeon any role or not? Sorry, we can't hear you. Your mic is muted. There is noise, Manju. You disconnect your Bluetooth and then speak on. Um, yeah, that, that's a better option, I believe. Disconnect from the device as well. Can you hear me, sir? Yep. Yes. Loud and clear. Yeah, allow me, I can uh, share a few slides uh, regarding uh, subcutaneous emphysema and how it was a very common uh, problem during the, especially during the second wave. Hello. Nazar, sir, please permit him. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, can you see this slide, sir? Yes. So uh, this was a very common phenomena. We used to get called almost once or twice a day from the ICUs and uh, uh, COVID wards where patient developed very severe subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, the uh, stark difference from other subcutaneous emphysema is where there was absolutely no pneumothorax. It was only subcutaneous emphysema which was there. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this was a very common phenomena in, especially in the second wave, where we could see a lot of cases like this, where we presented with subcutaneous emphysema, and uh, the general uh, tendency from the intensivist would be do something. So it is not something where we can uh, suddenly place a chest tube and uh, let the emphysema settle down. In uh, very rare cases, I was able to place a uh, drain into the anterior mediastinum. Uh, especially if the patient is having hypotension and shock, only in those cases I place this uh, uh, place uh, uh, place the drain under the subcutaneous uh, uh, in under the substernum so that the emphysema resolved. But uh, and even in some cases I asked my intervention radiologist also to do it. 
otherwise uh, yes we can try doing uh, anything to save the patient at that time but i don't think so there is much role in case of uh, subcutaneous emphysema alone sir thank you so much dr majida a very the message here would be uh, generally keep off lay keep your hands in your pockets do not interfere especially unless even a surgeon is a trained surgeon or he does it under fluoroscopy do not dare do it putting a subsepoid or a suprasternal drain yes uh, now can i invite dr ravi chandra he's a consultant cardiovascular thoracic surgeon a perfect gentleman a quiet man he works with sakra world hospital bangalore uh, could you take in take a question from the audience which says which is uh, from maharashtra and it's a, i don't know whether he's a doctor or somebody looks like a patient i'm sorry with due respect to him i had a pneumothorax spontaneous first instance post covid vat surgery for right lung 5 months before i still have heaviness pain numbness on right side from chest still stomach and on armpits and triceps areas will this pain go away my dear surgeon uh, or has there been this for a very tricky question um i mean um, yes. like damaged nerves is it true or some issue with surgery not done properly but i can see a litigation growing up here but <laughs> ravi yes. uh, good evening sir yes first of all thank you very much for uh, your, your excellent presentation it was very uh, informative and uh, you know it's a new precedent i could say that uh, the role of surgery uh, redefining things and challenging the guidelines so on and so forth sir and uh, coming to the question per se uh, this patient who has had a pneumothorax and uh, had a vat surgery for the right side and uh, going by his symptoms sir heaviness pain and numbness of the right side uh, you know some kind of numbness uh, can be expected at the surgical side but since this is a vat the even the possibility of uh, a numbness or even you know uh, because of the small incision that possibility is very very less i could say and uh, whatever his uh, the other symptoms has you we could attribute to uh, is uh, is definitely uh, in my opinion not directly related to the surgery itself so also we have been having reports that uh, some patients will have other few generalized symptoms like something like a long haul covid or long covid sequel different terms have been attributed to this so this uh, is probably part of that also we uh, uh, similar cases we have seen where uh, post covid 3 or 3 months or even 6 months later they they complain of uh, you know generalized numbness in the chest region or even in the peripheries also uh, probably vascular involvement or maybe vascular involvement so you know if we could have uh, some kind of histopathology uh, and more information on this uh, that can throw some light on uh, these uh, symptoms uh but yes i would uh, uh, you know i would uh, say that it is um, uh, not related to the surgery per se oh, thank you dr vichandra this is uh, probably again back to harsh this Sir. dr kiran chandi from chandigarh says um she has in fact uh, various questions one is uh, maybe i'll come back to what you had mentioned earlier this chest tube suction drains um, dr kirat you'll have to excuse me a run and chew a lot of questions but what would probably interest everybody is the use of negative suction drains we use senapi and uh, i would invite dr harsh to say a few words on it give his thoughts his experience how much does he believe in it so 100% sir negative suction drains uh, we use medela that is a continuous suction devices and uh, we have 36 in number with us so almost all the surgeries done in the department we use the medela in first few days uh, unless and until it's a clean cut case and there is uh, no air leak no uh, major resection we put put simple uh, uh, romosil kit or something but in almost all the cases particularly in cases of empyema decortications in cases where we do pyrectomy in the cases of primary spontaneous pneumothorax 
we use these negative section drains now coming to covid in uh, bpfs or uh, i won't call them bpfs in alveolar uh, pleural leaks we have used these uh, negative suction drains with uh, good success rate so around 70% of the patients with the, these um, small and uh, mid level leaks we were able to manage with uh, continuous negative suction uh, we, i don't have much uh, experience of using sanapi mostly we use medal as the negative suction device so well, thank you your answer to a two questions in i mean well, two birds with one stone you answered the uh, role of apf and bpf and uh, could you just elaborate a bit how would you approach sir, bpf apf a little sir, a few uh, lines yes sir sir so there is a difference between every air leak uh, uh, we have a tendency of calling it as a bpf but bpf particularly is when it's a segmental or uh, sub segmental leak and above that uh, which peripheral leaks are mostly alveolar pleural leaks so uh, so there, there are two kinds of thing i'll, I'll uh, uh, convert it into is as a peripheral bpf as, as a central bpf if there is a central bpf and it's it's mostly uh, post uh, uh this uh, lobectomy or something we'd like to uh, pick up the muscle like a intercostal muscle flap or a big muscle like a pectoralis major muscle flap and just sew the uh, bpf with that thing and in a peripheral bpf if we are going in we are doing a surgery like in most of the cases of covid what we did uh, these were cases with empyma plus bpf so we did a wedge resection of the B, uh, peripheral bpf firing a stapler and decorticated the rest of the plane applied negative suction and for around uh, uh, 72 hours to 5 uh, uh, to 6 days we applied this negative suction when there was a symphysis formed between the lung and the chest wall we uh, disconnected the medulla came back to the normal bottle and then uh, maybe when everything was well we just took out the chest tubes so uh, the there are three three kinds of scenarios one is a central bpf where we were able to save the things by uh, putting a muscle flap the uh, peripheral bpfs where we, we were able to do a uh, wedge uh, resection and uh, some alveolar alveolar leaks the patient is not well enough or uh, or sick enough ecox score is less so we used to put medulla and uh, negative suction and uh, uh, around 60 to 70% we were able to manage by that okay thank you so much uh, a little bit more this alveolar leaks are usually due to blebs you know so they're very superficial they tend to settle on its own or if they have a suction however dr arun khanla from Telangana Hyderabad has uh, given his opinion says will you connect this chest tube to suction for subcutaneous emphysema yes so uh, subcutaneous emphysema also has two components one is a subcutaneous emphysema with a pneumothorax in a subcutaneous emphysema with a pneumothorax it's better to put in a chest tube and then connect that chest tube to a negative suction if you do an hrct in a, a case of subcutaneous emphysema you are muted hush please unmute you and, uh, hello i'm audible oh yes. sorry hello Yeah, so if uh, the subcutaneous emphysema is not associated with the pneumothorax, we have tried medial channel drains in four or five cases, and all five cases uh, died. So uh, the thought process which came into the ICU, so uh, the thought process which came into the uh, in, uh, when we retrospectively uh, collected our data was that a subcutaneous emphysema in a case of uh, covid post covid is a very negative predictive factor of mortality it's a, it's a uh, almost i've seen uh, five patients i told you we put this yes brains in subcutaneous emphysema all five died so uh, the results are not encouraging uh if it is associated with the remote cells okay, thank you so much hello yeah we have a question hello. to dr ravi chandra ravi or uh, dr arun again from Tel- telangana says post lobectomy 
any bronchial dehiscence? I mean, uh, that's his question, but I'm sure it needs a little bit of elaboration. Probably he says, post-lobectomy, bronchial dehiscence, how do you manage? Do you see them in COVID, any particular concern? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, the indications in uh, post-COVID uh, lobectomy are very, very specific, like uh, isolated involvement of the lobe and so we have given adequate time for the lung to recover. And in spite of that, we find irreversible changes. Probably we can go ahead with the lobectomy. And uh, yes, uh, we can uh, top it up with an uh, intercostal flap when there is any doubt of the uh, distance at the bronchial stump. Uh, on table, we can assess the surgical stump of the, the, the bronchial stump. And uh, at that time, we will be able to move out and then we can uh, reinforce it with an intercostal uh, muscle flap. To improve the, uh, you know, to improve the healing of the bronchial stump and probably prevent any chances of a day sense of the bronchial stump. Good. Uh, when would you decide to go in? How long would you wait? You have a post-operative scenario, and obviously on table we check and we say there is no leak, and yeah. then unfortunately on day one or day two suddenly we start noticing leak, and then. Uh, how do you decide? Would you wait? Would you go in? What are your criteria for it? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you know, initially it was not there and in the post-operative period of probably after two to three days, we notice it and we will uh, will not be able to pull out the chest tube. Uh, in that situation, the earlier the better. We should uh, take a prudent call and then go ahead because if you keep on waiting, then the, there's a chance that the stump may uh, erode further. And probably we may have to go for uh, uh, a revision and then probably the, uh, the amount of excision uh, can be more, much more than we, uh, what we anticipated. So, uh, you know, probably uh, we, we would give 24 to 48 hours time and then, um, uh, then we decide to go ahead with the surgery and then uh, close the leak. Good. Thank you so much. Dr. Manjunath. Yes, sir. I don't know, we have had various discussions on uh, pneumonectomy. What is your take on a destroyed lung? And how would you describe a destroyed lung in COVID? Do we often see it or? Yes, sir. I've, I've seen a few cases in last two months, sir. Uh, I'll just share the uh, slides with you on that also. Uh, basically, when we look at the uh, 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 GGO, uh, like this is a typical COVID picture. And what we are seeing is there are large GGOs. What exactly happens to these GGOs in the long term? That is something I was actually looking at it. And then we had a few of the cases in the last month. So this is one of the patients with large GGOs in both the lungs. And then ultimately when the patient came after a few months, what we saw is there is a uh, component of uh, destroyed lung in, uh, in this patient. So you can see this, the whole upper lobe is destroyed. And then there was one more patient where uh, the uh, patient actually this patient, patient presented with pneumothorax. So there was a right side in pneumothorax and on evaluation, he also found out that the left side uh, lung was uh, completely destroyed. So although we were able to salvage the patient uh, by doing a right bullectomy and uh, pleurodesis, for now he is fine. But what ultimately what, uh, what, what should be done for the left side is something we have to worry about. And this is not just one case. I think we're going to see a lot of cases in this future. And uh, if if I if my prediction goes right, then maybe it will be a scenario just like tuberculosis we'll have, where we have long-term sequelae, where we keep on doing uh, lobectomies and uh, pneumonectomies for destroyed lung. Yeah, but we generally would agree that preferably to avoid a pneumonectomy. Yes, of course. Yeah, you, you would be losing, you know, salvageable lung. Yes, sir, definitely, sir. If if he has if he's having recurrent uh, infections and if he is having hemopsis, then then there is no choice then go ahead and do an immunectomy. Otherwise, we can still wait and uh, give a conservative trial for as long as possible. Oh, so we have heard diverse opinions on uh, the role of pneumonectomy in COVID lung. Yes. Um, basically, it will, it will boil down to the patient and the preferring doctor, the surgeon is what I guess, each yes. to his own. Yes. Um, Dr. Kira Chandigarh has been, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's your, blasting or bombarding us with a lot of questions. I wish to ask about the media's channel, Drain results put in pneumo media channel and retro channel. Uh, how were the results in media channel drain? Uh, I, 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 have think... in, I have tried in two patients, sir, and uh, 
unfortunately i have lost both the patients and uh, as uh, dr raj said the it is just a prognostic marker that say okay, maybe we can say that okay he won't he won't make it after that that, that is what i feel true, true good good it's not doesn't really help you know yes. but yes. in a desperate situation maybe when everything has been lost one yes, could possibly think of it but needs an expert hands otherwise it itself could be a disaster yes uh, coming back to dr vijay who has been waiting very patiently on the sidelines uh vijay what is your take like we have talked about bronchopleural fistulas has the interventional pulmonologist a major role to play or some role to play or no role to play but well, i think they have a major role to play yes the bpms yeah well, uh, before uh, that was a wonderful discussions that was happening between you and uh, bale and ravi and uh, harsh so before going further answering uh, on bpf from intervention pulmonologist perspective so there are uh, uh, krishnana has uh, uh, announced 1037 logins so far that's a brilliant uh, team effort from both cci and uh, cipla as well thank you cipla for uh, being with us and thank you technical team who are working day and night uh, for the webinars and coming to uh, bronchopleural fistulas um yes uh, it, the general notion uh, which was uh, uh, probably one and a half decade back when i was a student some of my professors used to tell according if i have a bronchopleural fistula okay please refer to your enemy pulmonologist enemy colleague whom you doesn't like it so but that was the notion but over the past one and a half decade there are huge advances in management of bronchopleural fistula as dr harsh was rightly pointing uh, usage of medila topaz device medila device okay has changed a lot the way we manage uh, bronchopleural fistula one second we started i particularly started probably you know, 12 years back with the application of uh, uh, glue cyanoacrylate glue into the identified uh, segment where the leak is there so it has got mixed results but probably few years back we lost one bronchoscope well, because of the leakage of uh, glue into the working channel so from there we decided not to use glue to occlude the bronchopleural fistula but basically it's a tedious work you need to have lot of patience and uh, once we uh, identify uh, identification of bronchopleural fistula may not be that easy in every case in most cases you have to take the patient under general anesthesia connect the medulla on the other side and then block each segment where you are suspecting and probably where you may not be suspecting on the uh, given side you have to test all the 8 to 10 segments and then identify particular bronchopleural uh, uh, seg bronchopulmonary segment where the leak is arriving once you arrive in, probably current day choice what i do as a senior intervention pulmonologist is i would love to go ahead and um, apply spigots we have done in few cases where majority of cases have um, successfully uh, even recently we have done one of uh, dr manjunath's case so uh, we have managed successfully bronchopleural fistula so it is tough you need to have exhibit lot of patience the counseling skills the art of counseling a patient and then family matters most you need to reassure them almost every bron bronchopleural fistula will have a solution at the end so if you cannot handle with either spigot or with um, atrial septal device closure okay that's a device uh, which can close the asd closure device which can uh, occlude the bronchopleural fistula these are the methods by which we do practice closure of bpf with really great results so please unmute yourself sir thank you so much uh, vijay very wise golden words spigots yes that seems to be very uh, the way forward you have to be having more centers doing it maybe you should also start having a training program for 
deployment of spigots, deployment of endobronchial valves, which will soon arrive in this country. Uh, now, a little challenging question. Like, uh, I wonder, Dr. Ravi would like to take that question. Is that, uh, you know, CT, EPH, post-COVID, thromboendocterectomy, have you any uh, opinion on that? CTEPH. Ravi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, and, I, mean, I know it's a very difficult area, especially. Yes, uh, so I, I'm sorry I've troubled you with this difficult question. But. No, no, sir. Uh, CTPH, in, uh, you know, in any other situation, uh, CTPH uh, surgery offers, uh, you know, you go under stark arrest and take out all the thrombus from the uh, branch pulmonary arteries and all that. In a COVID situation, uh, given the morbidity of having this, uh, you would uh, very much be happy managing medically. That's, you know, mo most most of the times, like, keep your hands in your pocket and just, uh, the, the there are different uh, uh, ways of handling it. Probably uh, we have done some thrombolysis also for some of the patients and they have responded quite well. And then we need to give them some more time, uh, thrombolysis, and then add, uh, top it up with anticoagulation, uh, keep a watch, uh, take, uh, you know, all the other measures, in, uh, whatever measures to improve the oxygenation of the patient. Uh, with all these things, uh, probably we should be able to pull them through, sir. Good one, good one. I totally on agree. On the other hand, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Nazir, uh, just one adi additional point here. So in case of chronic thromboembolic pH, so I don't think um, uh, thrombolysis works, but probably we may need to uh, use appropriate um, um, this Lovenox, the uh, Clexane, or fragmin and um, blood thinners, okay, to manage these patients rather than uh, I, uh, thrombolysis. The thrombolysis doesn't have any role in management of CTEPH. Management with blood thinners and along with uh, um, uh, management of uh, this, uh, what do you call, anti-PH therapy, Rio cigarette. So these may have some role, but invariably when the clot burden is too much in the vasculature, probably they may need a uh, endotrectomy. Oh, well said, Vijay. What I think Dr. Ravi meant was in the acute stage, the role of surgery. Right. Yeah, because uh, in fact, I was looking at the literature. I didn't find any case report or any of the surgeons abroad I spoke to. Uh, they have not ventured onto these patients. And... So the results, I'll just take it a little further, with ECMO, operating on patients with ECMO has also been very discouraging. Um, you know, the people are trying various things. Maybe they're taking in patients too late. Early, if their intervention might help. Uh, but that was very good words, uh, wise words, sound words, golden words from Vijay about CTPH. Yeah. Uh, I think Harsh is gone. I think he has a problem. He's not seen. Can, no, sir, can, here. You're there. <laughs> yes. Sir. You're there. Are you okay? And there's a yes, last sir. question. I'm not going to bother you too much because I know you have a problem there. If no, possible, sir. a word about lung transplantation. Um, if you deem it, I know it's not part of this today's talk, but uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be wondering why we have not mentioned lung transplantation. Sir, so, uh, transplant, we are not doing in uh, Medanta at the moment. But yes, uh, uh, one of my seniors, one of our seniors, Dr. Atavar, is doing it in Kims. And he uh, probably uh, has the highest number of post-COVID transplants. And he uh, says the mortality is around 30 to 40 percent. And uh, the survival rate is around 60 percent. There are very particular uh, uh, sets of indications for going for a transplant. I think it's a very uh, huge topic to be discussed. Uh, yeah, true. Uh, Separately, I think. I think true. Very, very true. Well said. Because uh, people only talk of their successes, and very few talk about failures. Uh, really? You and I've had failures in these uh, in our series, and the failure happened. I'll just share with you because we got void with our initial results operating on uh, COVID patients. We had a patient who had bilateral disease. So, in my wisdom, which is <laughs> foolish, which I'll realize later, was I thought if I could fix one side, the patient will improve. 
and then I get a chance on the left side. Well, my dear friend, in COVID, it does not work that way. No. Uh, so that's how we learned. Uh, we learn, burn our fingers and learn. And there is a very interesting statement from Dr. Aksar Khan. Uh, sir, excuse Rampur. me. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sir. Excuse me. Can I add a, yep, sure, add a one or two words about the transplant, sir? Uh, yes. In ba uh, in Bangalore, also recently, we have had a doctor. You know, this is. Uh, a little bit emotional to catch up with. Uh, so one of the doctors, uh, you know, Dr. Sanat Kumar, he's a, he was an intensivist. He's had a bilateral lung transplant recently in Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Sandeep Patel has done it. So, you know, probably in uh, rare situations when the donor pool is there and few all the other criteria are met, uh, probably we could consider lung transplant. Sure. But definitely, yes. Yes, sir. Five-year survival rate is 60%. And then... Well, the native lung is the best. Whatever is native, we, if we can improve on that, that is the best. Uh, 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 the, the thank you. Thing. Thank you so much, Ravi. Very, yes. Uh, and we wish Dr. Sanat a quick recovery and back to normal life. So Dr. Aksa Khan has put in a very good question. I will, if the patient was not completely recovered, if the patient was not completely recovered and one of his lungs is collapsed and the other one is partially damaged, so how will you operate such a patient? The very same question, can pneumonectomy be done or not, is Dr. Aksa's concern. Um, I think I'll take that answer. Yes, yours is very genuine concern. The outcome can be very tricky. It's a very difficult situation. And as earlier mentioned, depends upon the surgeon, the pulmonologist and the patient to take a call on that. Largely a challenging situation. Now again, Professor R.B. Kumar is back with us with a Question, post-CAG, CABG, bilateral bad lungs. Well, he's deviated from COVID and he emphatically, emphatically says, no history of COVID. Complain hemoptysis is right upper lobe, seven centimeter peak cavity. Can asymptomatic COVID present like this and the surgery indicated hemoptysis is the worry. Um, I will ask the pulmonologist first and then we'll take a call of the surgeon's view. Um, Deepthi, what would you like to, you know, it's basically, would you like to take a call on that? Uh, if there is no history of COVID, I think uh, the first thing we would go ahead and do is to confirm that uh, the present uh, situation is not a, a COVID situation. So I, again, uh, uh, an RT-PCR would be indicated. But uh, if it is only presenting as a, uh, um, that is, a cavity, then there are other uh, differential diagnoses to be considered. And uh, the first I would again uh, say is tuberculosis in our country. So if tuberculosis is ruled out, aspergillosis is ruled out, and malignancy is ruled out, then it, these are the major uh, differential diagnoses that we would be actually considering in the first place, more than COVID. So uh, uh, actually in this uh, condition, I don't know uh, why uh, COVID uh, would be uh, uh, considered at all. True, true. Well said. The question here is, is the continuing persisting hemoptysis. And if that per se cavity, we, that should, uh, if you're going and take it out, should fix the problem. But the uh, rider is bilateral bad lungs. We need to know the pulmonary function status before we dive into it. So here, uh, if I may add, Dr. Nazar, um, probably I would consider bronchial artery embolization as a first choice because the persistent hemoptysis is there, patient uh, uh, is having bad lungs. He may not be fit for any procedure, particularly thoracotomy or VATS, whatever it may be. He may not be fit for a general anesthesia. So I would love to take the patient for uh, ambulation and then control the bleeding first and then assess further by uh, uh, for fitness of um, any surgical management at a later date. Well said. It's a bridging procedure. Uh, invariably, the other channels open up, collaterals open up. And we have Dr. Ravi Doshi from Indore, our own secretary. Hello, Ravi. Thanks for joining us. I saw the first letter, how do you do is what I thought. But it is how do you operate a case of umbilical hernia or inguinal hernia with post-COVID fibrosis? Will that uh, can... Do it under uh, the panel? Sorry? Do it under spinal anesthesia. Oh, can I put that question okay to you? Yes. Because, you know, if too many people start talking over each other, there'll be total confusion. Yes. But you know, go ahead. 
Yeah. We can offer a patient uh, to undergo surgery under spinal anesthesia where we can reduce the risk of uh, respiratory complications in the post-op. True. Well said. Well said. Because the fear about general anesthesia, even for thoracic surgery in post-COVID cases, is the once they go on ventilator, the prognosis is bad. It's very difficult to get them off ventilator. Preferably, they should be extubated on table and then your results and the outcome will be much better. Uh, we have another question coming in from... Oh, we have Dr. Atri saying wonderfully highly appreciated. Let's, that's also very encouraging. Uh, as well as uh, good comments coming in from Dr. Kirat Chandigarh. Thank you so much. Now, Dr. Thridip has put this question, he has put to me this question earlier too, but I will open it to the panelists to answer this question of, uh, yes, pre-surgery like lobectomy, do you do a bronchoscopy to see the bronchial wall to decide on where to clamp the bronchus? Ravi? Pre-surgery yes, like lobectomy, do you do a bronchoscopy to uh, assess where you're going to divide the bronchus? Yes, the pre-surgery, intraoperatively, we have uh, uh, intraoperative bronchoscopy, we can do that. And along with that, we have a good uh, resolution CT scan. So we'll be able to you know, uh, make out the anatomically where and all those things. It is uh, probably not a, you know, not a 100% prerequisite, but intraoperative bronchoscopy or a preoperative bronchoscopy definitely will give additional information. And sure. Thank you. Add onto that. Now, I can see where that's coming from, Dr. Tradeep, because uh, in the earlier days, bronchoscopy prior to surgery had to be done by the thoracic surgeons to assess what you were mentioning, to look for those areas. So bronchoscopy used to be done preoperatively by the surgeons. Now, back to myocard mycosis, Dr. Kirat Chandigarh, please throw some light on indication to seek surgery for lung involvement in myocard in case of ENT involvement. We are quick with FES and surgery, but for lungs, generally this decision needs clarity. Very well worded, a good statement. Uh, maybe, Harsh, can you take that question? Sir, yes. Sir, we have operated around seven cases where we did a combined surgery with ENT surgeons. So uh, the point was that uh, what we do, uh, sir, mucomycosis has got a very... Uh, uh, now, now we have have a protocol of operating upon these patients. What we do, we take uh, most of these patients present to the pulmonologist with hemoptosis, and they see a, uh, if there is a localized cavity which can be resected. They uh, do a bronchoscopy, a bulb, or a biopsy of that cavity, prove that it is a mucomycosis, and then they put these patients on a few days of around four to five days of amphotericin, liposomal amphotericin B, and then they uh, shift over the patient to us for operating. In the meantime, when the patient is having these, this amphotericin B, uh, we prepared the patient for surgery uh, nutritionally and uh, some, some uh, pre-operative physiotherapy and all those stuff. And then we operate upon the patient. So uh, around seven patients we were able to find because we always uh, call for an ENT opinion in these patients. And when they examine or they do an MRI or the sinuses, they sometimes found, found the sinus to be uh, loaded. So in these seven patients, we were able to do dual procedure, first combined with some kind of lung resection. So most of our, around six of these patients underwent lobectomy, and one uh, and after the sessions on uh, uh, around uh, two to three weeks of liposomal amphotericin B, and then uh, on uh, postoconazole for around two months. So this is the unit protocol now we have for uh, mucomycosis. Uh, thank you, Doctor Arsh. Quickly, do all patients of lung with mucor require surgery? Sir, so if it is a bilateral involvement, extensive involvement, involvement of the mediastinum, the, uh, but the other lung is also in a destroyed state because of the COVID infections, you can't go in. Then it's a pulmonology call, it's a medical call, <coughs> becomes a medical call. Would you uh, try amphotericin B and C and watch uh, for a while? Or? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, three 
it's just uh, we did uh, it was a prolonged uh, after that resolution you'll find a lo localized cavity in one of the lobes we removed it and the results are good excellent excellent uh, bronchic cases any role of surgery i think that was self explanatory i mentioned it localized bronchic cases we could consider surgery now the question is uh, the first wave and the second wave we know the medical aspects of it. Does that have an influence on the on the kind of patients who require surgery or the outcome of these patients? Uh, Dr. Manjunath, would you like to take that question? Yes, sir. First wave and second wave? First wave, uh, the uh, incidence of mucormycosis was much less when we compared to the second wave, sir. Uh, in, in our center, we did about uh, 10 cases of mucormycosis in the second wave. In the first wave, we did one case and one, uh, I think two patients of uh, Dr. CVK were managed uh, with amphotericin alone. If I'm yes. not, I think two or three, I'm not, I'm not exactly remember the number. Uh, that was one thing, sir. And the other thing is the involvement of lung in the second wave was much more uh, in terms of the oral area of involvement by the mucor itself. The, uh, uh, I, I had to do one lingulectomy plus door lobectomy for a patient because of the large area of involvement and the higher involvement uh, in that case. So that case didn't make it, but otherwise other patients were mostly in the peripheral where we, where we were able to do a wedge resection and a lobectomy in those cases. True, great. I think that's a, a fairly well summarized pre-op and uh, surgical interventions. I think we have covered all the topics and thank you, Abhijay. But it does not end with surgery alone. There's something more after surgery which is equally or in fact more important. Any about rehabilitation, post-op care, where again our friends from pulmonology come in. Um, could we start with Dr. Deepthi about say post-op care, CT? You have seen a lot of, of your work with us, so might have some memory of the way we mandle or what you think post-op, CT, post-op, ultrasound. Um, anything in particular you wish to say? Am I Your voice is low, but you are audible. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, first of uh, care, I think that makes all the difference. So, uh, number one is uh, whether uh, they are going in for any complications. So, uh, that is where the whole uh, um, scenario of uh, a proper uh, test imaging, a proper ultrasound comes in. And uh, I think uh, particularly during the COVID time, I think uh, it was uh, like uh, ultrasound was a very useful tool because uh, it was like a stethoscope and uh, where, where we were getting a real-time assessment from the uh, uh, patient where we are unable to use a stethoscope, we had an ultrasound in our hand. So uh, a lung ultrasound is probably a good tool uh, for a post-op uh, <coughs> assessment. Particularly, you want to rule out uh, uh, the you know, <coughs> complications like pneumothorax or if the uh, patient has gone for any effusions or uh, yeah, any other uh, underlying consolidation. All these uh, factors could be covered up uh, by the ultrasound <coughs> itself. So a real-time quick assessment can be done every day. So a lung ultrasound is a good uh, uh, option when you're uh, having a uh, ma managing a post-op case. Again, uh, shifting the patient for a CT and uh, X-ray would be a little difficult uh, uh, when it comes to uh, post-op care. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we have Professor R.V. Kumar coming back and saying all other etiologies were ruled out in that particular case with a large cavity, hemoptysis, bilateral lungs, post-CABG. What do we do? I think, sir, so, as Dr. Uh, Vijay said, we should try bronchial arterial embolization by time and then reassess once. You know what happens is when there is hemoptysis, there's a lot of aspiration. So that can mask the exact underlying status of the patient's uh, lung. So once we clear the lung, we could have a better assessment and that bad lung could become a better lung. And we could go in and do a definitive procedure. Uh, we can always keep that in mind. And Dr. Kirat is back asking about mucor. Would you want early surgery mucor like in ENT? I think that was also answered. We don't rush yes. in unless, you know, the patient demands surgery. In other words, he has symptoms. He's crying out for surgery. And Dr. Vijay Kumar, 
Yes, what sir. about post-op rehabilitation? And there, you know, surgeons come and do their job <laughs> and they say, come and tell the patient, I've done my job. Yeah. Uh, God has done his job. Huh? Now it's all, all up to the pulmonologist and the patient. I, I just want to add a quick comment before, you know, jumping into this uh, post-op case, sir. So, uh, a role of surgery, particularly in mucormycosis, we have good uh, experience in the past one and a half year, thanks to COVID-related complications. <clears throat> Remember, room was not built in a day. A cavity which was forming, once upon a time, it was a nodule. Please make sure the moment patient have different kind of symptoms, started spikes of fever, started having a streaky hemoptysis, that is good enough to uh, catch your attention, get a CT scan or a, a PET CT scan. We have done, you know, a few cases where PET CT as well. Among the diffuse ground glass opacities, PET CT can pick up where exactly is the nodule is. So such a kind of cases, identify it and uh, do a biopsy, either bronchoscopy guided biopsy or CT guided biopsy, uh, arrive at the diagnosis and treat early. You can avoid surgery because if the patient is requiring surgery, then probably the complications out of uh, such management of advanced case is pretty high. Point number one. Point number two, disseminated mucor. Disseminated mucor, Dr. Hirsch uh, um, did responded very well. One interesting case which I want to share is patient had mucor everywhere. That means eyes and nose and then lungs. So, but the lungs are pretty bad with a score of 25 by 25 CT CVRT score. And uh, he was hardly uh, uh, stable enough for even any procedure. So that's why we optimize him medically. And then um, with after giving amphotericin and after managing with proper steroid, the key in management of mucormycosis is management of glycemic control. If you can manage your glycemic control, mucor stops growing there further. So that's how. So we stabilized him. Uh, by, I think, enucleation or evisceration of left eye and then uh, sinonasal mucormycosis was operated and uh, lung, there was a cavity, thin cavity around 2 to 2.5 centimeter. We haven't operated, we just managed medically. Even a cavity, small size cavity, we can manage medically very well. That's what. Uh, thank you, sir, for allowing me to share this experience. And Coming to rehabilitation, which, which is very, very crucial in management of all post-op patients. If you want to run a successful thoracic surgery program and an intervention pulmonology program, it is mandatory to have a very good rehab program as well. And in immediate post-op, it is very much needed to control the pain and then early mobilization. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Manju and uh, our team here uh, agree here. On day one, okay, day zero, we don't have any experience of mobilizing the patient. But from day one onwards, we will make sure that patient walks at least few steps so that it, it gives confidence to the patient. It gives confidence to the team and the morbidities and mortality will definitely come down and chance of having a secondary pneumonia will come down. It gives a lot of confidence to the families as well. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so if, I can, if I can put in a word, if I can yeah, put please, in a word. please, please. So, so uh, a dictum in thoracic surgery, I guess, is uh, when you are doing general surgery and then uh, probably shifted to thoracic surgery. So it, it is said in our unit that if you operate upon 100 patients and do lab cholecystectomy in them, and if you don't uh, do aggressive physiotherapy in uh, all of them in the next post of day, 100 will go home. But if you do 100 lobectomies and you don't do aggressive physiotherapy in these patients, none will go home. So the point is we mobilize, we follow the ERAS protocol in all our patients. We mobilize them after four hours of surgery. And the very next day, they are doing aggressive physiotherapy. On the second post of day, they are doing treadmill and uh, all those stuff. We have a dedicated physiotherapy department for that. So aggressiveness in post-operative period is the most important thing in thoracic surgery, I guess. True, true. Well said. Yeah, we, for the last uh, 25 years, I've been, You'll be mobilizing the patient. You have to coax them. They have pain. Pain is the main issue. They keep saying, I'm 
my I will work on the biometry. Huh? It's just like saying I'll get. Uh, let me first get into IAS and then I'll study for exams. <laughs> now we have a final question from Dr. Arun Kangla. Post COVID non-expanding fibrotic lung management, space issues. Good one. Space issues. Who would like to take that? Uh, Ravi. Ravi would like to take that space issues in post COVID non-expanding fibrotic lung. Or maybe the, yeah, after that we'll take Vijay's opinion, pulmonologist's opinion as well. Ravi, yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, so absolutely, we have to, you know, post COVID non expanding lung, probably, you know, because of the fibrosis and other things, we have given adequate time, adequate physiotherapy, we have tried all the other measures. Is uh, you know try to uh, uh, mobilize the patient, physiotherapy, spirometry, all these things. In spite of that, uh, the lung is not expanded. Uh, then probably we can uh, uh, go ahead with uh, uh, you know you will do a CT scan and if there is uh, some kind of uh, collapse with uh, thickened parietal pleura, any secondary changes due to COVID. In that case, uh, VATS procedure we can. Uh, 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 offer them and uh, probably if, if there is any kind of uh, you know who's had a uh, uh, parietal pleura or something probably in that situations we can go ahead and uh, and we could uh, you know do a decortication wires and then probably look at expansion of the lung of if it is unilateral involvement dr vijay would you like to add something no, Space sir. Uh, no i would like to add yeah. i would like to add a few points sir. In a post-COVID scenario, the lung is not expanding. Uh, just put in a chest tube, keep the cavity clean, let the lung uh, fibrosis or the inflammation settle. Uh, do a CT scan. If you can find a good parietal peel over the lung, wait, wait, uh, hold your horses, wait for around one month, two months till the patient is okay, is off oxygen, his saturation is maintained between 93, 95, and then you can offer him a bad decortication. If there is active air leak from one, one of the points, you can uh, combine the wedge with decortication, or you can do a pure decortication in these cases. Most of these patients improve. Yeah, anything, any non aggressive, non interventional surgery other than surgery? Any uh, thoughts, Vijay? So, the beauty of uh, uh, post COVID fibrosis is as yes. defined by presence of reticularity, fraction bronchitis, some degree of honeycombing. With the time, everything is settling. Almost 85 to 90 percent of lungs, uh, lung recovery we are seeing. Almost the scans are becoming near traction bronchitis completely disappearing, reticularity completely disappearing, honeycombing. Some amount of honeycombing is persisting. We need to be, as Hirsch rightly said, we need to be really patient enough, give time, and then manage medically possible, and uh, the uh, miracle will unfold. Yeah, basically it comes down, don't be, just because, don't treat the x-ray, treat yes. the patient. Basically it comes down to that. More patients, the longer you wait, most of them recover, the space vanishes. Otherwise, you know, the diaphragm starts going up, media sternum shifts. And if it's not causing problem, why intervene? Why put your foot into your mouth, as they say? Uh, uh, and I would like to say at this point that we have had, this had interesting discussions not only on the medical aspects, on the social aspects, the men, minds of the patient. And again, I reiterate, you know, we can cure sometimes, relieve often, but always, always comfort patients. And on this note, we had uh, the CCI was set ablaze, but there was something beyond pulmonology. I'm sure all of you read that article of Dr. Amita name. It is what is quite inspiring. And similarly, we need to think outside pulmonology, both in our practice, think out of the box, challenge guidelines, be the difference and you be the change. Uh, I should also thank, uh, if, before I move on, Dr. Nagendra, the president of the society, Dr. Ravi Doshi, Dr. Krishna, of course, whom I acknowledged in the beginning. However, that part I think was uh, muted or just with a lot of disturbance. Dr. Atri, Dr. Uh, whom have Dr. Narayana Pradeep, who was kind enough to be there in the dressing room, in the green room, before all this started. And of course, CCI, a wonderful organization with a lot of both family as well as social and medical 
uh, inputs. Any of the panelists would like to say, because I think with that, I think we have covered almost everything. And I should thank each of you, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Deepthi, Dr. Manjunath, Dr. Harsh, and of course, the gentleman who's behind the CCI webinars. Congratulations, Dr. Vijay and to the CCI for continuously, persistently not miss out, missing out a week. On Thursday comes CCI meeting. Fantastic work. Keep it up. Sir, masters like you are the source of inspiration, sir. You have a zeal to deliver the knowledge and uh, spread the wisdom so that the guideline, which is practiced at your center, at Medanta Delhi, at Apollo Hyderabad, uh, must be reached to remote corner of villages. That is the motto of CCI. Uh, whenever we, are, uh, we want your presence, your uh, you are there to uh, bless us, CCI, with your valuable time and valuable contribution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We had a lovely meeting. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, one and all, Dr. Deepti, Dr. Ravi, uh, Dr. Manju, and Dr. Harsh. Brilliant inputs from each one of you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Stay safe. Stay blessed. And good night. I, I would like to add that uh, for once, uh, I actually saw a very cordial and uh, very uh, uh, encouraging and motivating talk by all of us, because I have seen uh, 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 debates between uh, uh, thoracic surgeons and pulmonologists before, not always uh, on a cordial note, but this was so pleasant. And uh, really, it is amazing that all of us agreed on all the points. And if that is the way that pulmonology and uh, thoracic surgery can work together, I think uh, there is a lot going for India. Sure. Well said. We agree to disagree on certain points, but with a smile. Nice words. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, CCI. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night.